In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Do not be afraid. Those words run like a refrain throughout the Bible. Do not fear, do not worry, Jesus says over and over, especially in the Gospel of Luke and especially in this section of Luke that we have been hearing on Sundays. Do not worry about your life, he says, right after the parable that we heard last week. You all remember that parable, of course, and you remember the very fine sermon that Canon Michener preached on it. It's the parable about the rich farmer or the rich fool who decides to build more barns to store to save his abundant harvest for himself only to hear that that very night, his life, his soul will be demanded of him. Don't worry about your life, Jesus says, as commentary on that parable. Don't worry about what you will eat or wear, for life is more than food and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens, the lilies, the grass of the field, how God clothes them and feeds and values them. How much more? How much more must God value and provide for you? So don't worry about these things, he says, for your father knows. Your father knows that you need them. Instead, strive for the kingdom of God, and these things will be given to you. And guess what Jesus says next? If you're not sure, here's a hint. It's the beginning of today's gospel reading. Do not be afraid. That's it. You got it. Do not be afraid, little flock. For it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Okay. Okay, Jesus, enough already. We get it. Or do we? Did anyone fly anywhere this summer? I did. Then you likely witnessed this strange yet time-honored ritual at the gate. All these people with boarding passes in hand. You know what a boarding pass means, right? You have a seat on the plane, an assigned seat on the plane. All these people with boarding passes in hand, crowding in on the boarding area, staking out a place in line, and shooting an evil eye at anyone who even thinks about breaking in line. As if, as if the assigned seats were going to run out, or as if those who got on the plane last were going to arrive at the destination way after everyone else, or incur some other unknown disadvantage. It's odd, isn't it? And yet it happens time and again without fail. Or remember the pandemic runs on things like toilet paper, hand sanitizer, disinfectants, and so many other things. There was plenty available until people decided there wasn't and rushed to get what they could, all that they could, thus creating the very scarcity that they feared. With some of us having enough toilet paper to last for a year, some probably still have toilet paper in their basements or storage closets, while others had to, well, 
innovate. Yes, we recognize these behaviors, don't we? And we recognize the beliefs that underlie them. There isn't enough. You always need more, more than what you have. More money, time, knowledge, recognition, time, talent, turf. And if you don't get it, someone else will. And that will be a problem for you somehow. And when you do get it, so the reasoning goes, that ever elusive more, then you'll rest. Then you'll enjoy what you have. Then you'll share what you have. Then you will be free. These are the lies of scarcity. That's what hunger activist Lynn Twist calls them in her book, The Soul of Money. The lies of scarcity, she says, claim that there is not enough. That's first, that more is better, more is necessary and that there will always be winners and losers. There will always be hunger and poverty and inequity. These are just the ways of the world and we really have no choice. It's the way it is. And what do these assumptions and behaviors do? Well, we've seen it. They create the very scarcity, the very inequality that they're supposed to protect against. And, and they diminish what we do have. They diminish the resources, the relationships, the blessings, the ideas, the time that we do have. And they distract us. They distract us from the beauty of the earth, the beauty of this moment, the beauty of the gifts, the beauty of the people who are here now. They distract us and they distance us from our true values and our true selves. That's right. The fear of scarcity or, or the imagined or real lack of anything, of money or power or toilet paper and other necessities, it can become a justification for greed or for inaction or for prejudice, inequity, dishonesty, exploitation, envy. It can justify diminishing others to build ourselves up, hoarding our treasure, working more than we need to when we really want to rest or to do the things or be with the people who really matter to us. This is not who we want to be, is it? And it's not who we are. And it's exhausting. So Jesus offers, Jesus opens up another way. Do not fear. Do not worry. Let go, loosen your grip on those things that bind you. Sell your possessions, give alms, make purses that don't wear out. Now let's face it. At first, this may sound to some of us like more of the same. There's one more thing you need to do, one more thing you are not getting right. So stop worrying conquer your fear. And when you've done that, there's more still. Sell your possessions, give alms, learn how to sew and make a purse. 
the worriers among us are likely to respond to this, how? With more worry. In fact, this is a good time to share with you this nugget of hard-earned wisdom. Telling a distressed person or a distressed spouse or teenage child to calm down or telling a scared person not to be afraid only exacerbates their fear or distress and often leads them feeling more alone and helpless and misunderstood and perhaps irritated with you. That's not what Jesus is doing here. Jesus is telling the truth, the truth that there is enough. You are enough. You are valued and precious. And God's got you. Jesus is not diminishing or ignoring our needs and worries. No, he names them. Yes, you need clothing, food, drink, housing, physical safety, healing, purpose. Yes, you need to pass the class and pay the bills. You need to care for your children or parents or friends. God knows. God knows. God knows what you need, what you fear. God knows what keeps you up at night. God knows you. And it is God's good pleasure to give you what you really need. It's God's delight to give you the kingdom the true kingdom where there is true freedom and true abundance for everyone today. Now, it's worth pausing for a moment here and considering this word abundance. In particular, I want to hear a concern raised by some environmentalists and economic philosophers about the notion of abundance. To some people, even to some Christians historically or today, they argue, abundance has implied that our resources are inexhaustible and has led to carelessness about them. It has justified the unquestioned drive for more the unquestioned drive for endless growth or expansion of territory, population, productivity, profit, business, or in the church, more people, higher attendance numbers, more programs. And because of this, they suggest sufficiency, sufficiency, could be a more helpful and accurate term. After all, isn't sufficiency what we see in nature? That may be why Jesus keeps pointing us to birds and grass and sheep and trees. They take what they need and no more. They grow to the right size and then stop. There is enough, yes, and it is finite. There is enough and it is finite. That's what Lynn Twist says sufficiency means. And this finiteness is not a threat. On the contrary, on the contrary, it makes what is there even more precious, and what we do with it even more important. It creates, it creates a more accurate, more mindful relationship with what is, and calls us to be more 
careful and generous stewards of what is. Nature is a good teacher here. Nature's a great teacher always. But Jesus isn't just talking about nature, is he? Nature, after all, is impersonal. But Jesus is talking about God, our Father. Jesus is talking about our good and generous God who sees and loves and cares and provides for each and every one of us, personally and infinitely, in abundance. The abundance, the freedom, the meaning we seek, they're here already. They're here already in God. There is abundance in God. And we know that abundance not through material prosperity, not through any particular amount of anything in particular, but as we experience and receive God's kingdom. We know that abundance as we dwell in and proclaim with our lives God's sufficient and abundant goodness and love. That is the truth. And that is the promise of Jesus. And that changes everything. It frees us from fear for trust and hope and joy. It frees us to invest in what really matters and to offer what we can and who we are already. It frees us to celebrate and give thanks for and be generous with what is. It frees us to make a difference with what we have today. And for that, we give thanks to God. Amen.